Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Terry, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Terry. And I welcome everybody here. I was one of the last ones here, but... Uh, I guess everybody comes from the coast, uh, but everybody came from Bend, you got, you met a semi across the road for three hours anyway. Uh, you don't want to know about all that stuff. Uh, this, um, a lot of you are veterans of retreats, and some of you aren't, I guess. I just want to say a, a word about a retreat. I think it's a time it's not a workshop or a lecture series. Uh, it's a time to get in touch with God's gift. See, we're already being drawn into a deep spiritual awakening, and there's a lot of experience and deep spiritual change in everybody in this room right now. And if we had the right kind of facilitator, we could write the big book. Could. I mean, the ammunition's here. Uh, the, if we could discern our own experience well enough, if we could put our finger on the authentic and the, what's really touched our heart in a healthy way and be able to tell the difference between that and what isn't so genuine and deep. And, uh, but it's all here. All the good deep stuff is here. Uh, and what happens as we go along is that God's gift tends to get obscured by the onrush of life. It especially get, and there's a funny thing that happens where it gets obscured, um, just by getting better. You know? It's a paradoxical thing that nobody starts getting better until they get worse. <laughs> nobody gets interested in the spiritual life until we're sure nothing else works. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the, the, the process of making sure nothing else works usually just about kills a person <laughs> and finding out. So we're suffering very deep frustration and helplessness and kind of a demoralization that for most alcoholics and Al-Anon members, it amounts to being so beat up by struggling and trying to make it work in the way we think we should. Trying to drink right not get into trouble, uh, <clears throat> and trying to not drink at all and be cheerful and well-balanced, <laughs> or, or trying to um, uh, run a family and, and uh, not control everybody, but just get enough cooperation for their own good <laughs> that'll <laughs> save them. Uh, and when the measure of frustration gets intense enough, we give up the whole project of trying. We just lose interest in it, you know? We get bored with it. Just <clears throat> run out. And that's the, the moment of openness to God's grace. That's the, somehow, the hitting bottom is, and I'm, that's what I want to really meditate on here. This, this time is the hitting bottom and uh, powerlessness. But just this introductory thing about what's a retreat about, that as we get in through powerlessness to begin our recovery, we uh, indeed get touched with the program. We start getting the message. We start letting our higher power be kind to us through other people. And we start making peace with the truth about ourselves. Oh, Oh, I don't have to get over it. I don't have to get over being a dingbat alky who's an egomaniac with a dirty mind. <laughs> I don't get over that at all? No, you don't get over it. You stay that way. But you... you God has lots of experience working with that type. And you'll, you'll be all right. You just, you get used to being who and what you are. 
and then a day at a time don't drink. <laughs> and uh, uh, what is this anyway? This is anyway. Uh, and then by simply not drinking and by letting go and letting people be kind of doing the the basic um, turning over that we do, we get a reward right away. The minute we put the program into action, it works for anybody who does it. And it works precisely to the extent that we do footwork. And we get the payoff starting now. It isn't like way down the road when you graduate. It's the first day uh, that we're willing to be open and not have it. It's just wonderful. Um, and the more we get um, recovery, the better we feel, the better we feel, and the more we do other footwork, the healthier we are and the and the better we we live. We we live in a way that's self respect begins to turn return and we start to be effective in what we want to do. And as we start to be effective in what we want to do, a couple of things happen. One is is that we're not hurting as much, and so we don't have the same motivation to be interested in the spiritual life as we had when we started. <laughs> And besides not being in the same amount of pain, we also can't help but wonder how well we're doing. You, know, you, just, you can't help but be interested. You know, just how well is my recovery going on? Well, how can you tell? By comparing yourself to somebody else's. Uh, how well are you doing at your work? Compare yourself to the other person. Do they get a better report? And as soon as we're not in pain and paying attention to how well we're doing, God's gift becomes obscured and we need a retreat. As soon as we're doing that, we get filled with other stuff and the shine goes off the apple, you know. It's just, it happens to everybody. It happens to me, it happens to... That's the way the Catholics got these retreat houses going to begin. This is way before AA or al uh, And it was uh, mostly for the people, the professionals, you know, uh, that the people who are supposed to be working at this on a steady basis need retreats more than anybody else. Uh, because they, they just do. They do. So th that's that. Um, I'd like to just reflect with you on the basically the first step. You know, admitting we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable. The um, I, I think if we it's my favorite step. It's the most characteristic step of the program. The surrender step is the heart of recovery, and everything else we do is kind of putting surrender into action, and it's kind of the heart of the spiritual life. But the first step is the signature of our program. That's the that's what makes AA and Al-Anon what it is. Uh, and then the rest of it is standard spirituality. What, um, uh, and the first step, you know, is this, you come right, right off the bat, they come at you with something that just turns everything upside down as our recovery begins. Uh, we come to the program and we hear rumors that Al-Anon will help you. Uh, I say Al-Anon because I already met some people in Al-Anon. I'm assuming this is kind of a group of recovering people of alcoholics, dope fiends, Al-Anons. Uh, yeah, yeah, mixed, mixed religion. Um, and, um, and as soon as we start out, they, they tell you uh, that, um, that they're not going to help you. They're not going to help you in the way you want to be helped. What we want to, I want to learn how to drink right or learn how not to drink and be hip and cheerful and have, and be in such good shape that my alcoholism is invisible. I want to, I, I don't mind being an alcoholic as long as I don't feel it and you don't see it. Uh, and, and AA says, no, we're not going to help you do that. We'd like you to, 
Oh, we're going to rub your nose in it. No. <laughs> we're going to hold your hand while you get used to being alcoholic, and you're going to be more alcoholic than you ever dreamed when you're done with this. It's, it's a funny way to introduce it. But that's the, the first step. Um, to get to the point. The point's made in, um, in the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. Now, that prayer is answered, starts to be answered in the very beginning of our recovery when the, the distinction starts to be made between the things we cannot change and the things we can change. Um, and when, in our illness, I don't think any of us ever spend two minutes wondering. Did you ever? I never wondered. Gee, I wonder what the things are that I can't change and what the things... I mean, I never, I never asked that. You know? I just had this vague thing that there was a go big gob of pain and frustration in my life. And I wanted to get rid of it. I wanted to dissolve it or take care of it. I wanted it to go away. Uh, that's all. And, and so they stop you at the door and say, we'd like to make a distinction. What do you mean distinction? I want to get rid of this thing. I want to get over it. Help me. Well, we're making a distinction. See, all running through the big gob is your disease of alcoholism, your disease of codependency, your disease, as they call it, of belief in control, <laughs> your deeply rooted belief that if you could just control a little better, it would help everyone a lot. <laughs> you know? uh, and that's a form of insanity that every human being gets, almost. And running through this big gob is, is our disease, our alcoholism and our belief in control. And then all of the behavior and feelings and actions that come from, from that disease. And want to say, guess what? You don't have to do the things that the disease pushes you to do. But the only way you can possibly, with God's help, do the footwork and not have a drink a day at a time, is with God's help, get on better terms with your disease. Make friends with it. Get acquainted with it. Go out with it. Uh, introduce it to your friends. Um, listen to your, to your friends about their disease. Introduce your disease to their disease. Uh, have them play together, you know. Uh, really bring it to the family, you know, this, and get used to it instead of, and then change. We really change. But we change footwork. And we don't change anybody. We don't change people, places, and things. We don't play into our disease. And that's, huh? You know? And we usually don't get that kind of a lecture about it. People simply start treating us. They just lead us along and have us do things that indicate that the important thing is to change our footwork and to accept ourselves fully without any reservations as who we are. Um, that falls in deaf ears until we've been through what they call hitting bottom. Um, because we can't hear that. Um, now, uh, I'm not going to tell my story now, but but just kind of follow. I want to do follow my own experience a bit, just to il illustrate my understanding of what kind of resistance everybody puts up. Uh, I think it's important for us to to see that our resistance to the first step is rooted not in some kind of a childish, like the worst part of us. No, I won't cooperate. No. Uh, it's rooted in our highest ideals. It's rooted in the thing in us that wants to be loyal to family and not disappoint our mothers and be good. We, you know, our parents and everybody knew we weren't going to be perfect, but they didn't think you were going to be an alcoholic. <laughs> you know? They didn't think you were going to be so off that once someone else had alcoholism in your family, you got right in there, cooperated with it, and helped it be worse uh, <laughs> in your efforts to help it out. That you did everything backwards and wrong. That you, They didn't raise you to be that dumb. Uh, 
And so we, there's something in us that, that doesn't want to be that, not just because we don't want to be embarrassed, but because we have to maintain something. We have to maintain some sense of ourselves as worthwhile. Uh, my definition of worthwhile is um, somebody who has a little sense. I kind of came on that recently. Because my own story about being an alcoholic is that I'm, the word alcoholism gained respectability in my family when I was very young. My father got into AA in 1943. 44. He had a couple of slips. He died in withdrawal when I was six and a half years old. I had three little sisters and an older brother. Uh, but not be, he died not before he brought home easy does it one day at a time. It's a disease. The first drink gets you drunk. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. And so we had all of this stuff. And the, don't think you're, don't think badly of your father and your uncles. They have a disease. Pray for them. So I prayed for them. My mother had three brothers who were alcoholic too. Uh, so I grew up with my uncle Bill and my uncle Matt. And a few married into the family too. Uncle Ed. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I, uh, I was aware of alcoholism, and my mother even used to point out, you see, see that man, Mr. Moorfield, he is an alcoholic, and he's been sober for five years, and isn't that wonderful? We, that's just, he would, she, I remember her pointing out this guy, an admiration, that this is just great, it's an alcoholic who's sober. And so I had this attitude that uh, alcoholism isn't wrong, or bad, it's a disease, and the important thing is you accept God's help. That's pretty advanced for the 40s, you know. And uh, so I grew up with that stuff. I went to meetings with my Uncle Bill when I got in the program when I was 12 or 13. I wrote a paper on alcoholism after I got in college in the seminary. Uh, went to meetings for research again. I read the big book two years before I had a drink and several other books. And it was almost my hobby before I drank. And, uh, <laughs> And when I, when I started drinking, um, you know, you can talk about crossing the invisible line. I crossed the invisible line sometime in the early afternoon of my 21st birthday, <laughs> the day I began to drink. And uh, I was obsessed in the way we are familiar with, you know, just not, I just thought it was absolutely wonderful, the most wonderful, God, I could. I gained a deeper respect for my father and my uncles on the spot. Uh, I, um, I just loved it. I could hardly wait to the next time I got some. And I thought of alcoholism the first day, and I thought, boy, whatever you do, don't become an alcoholic, because that means you can't drink. Be careful. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so the never occurred to me that I ever could possibly be demented like my Uncle Bill and my father. You know, the, and as I went along, it just picked up. You know, the disease progressed. Uh, didn't get to drink much in those early years. But as, it, as I was ordained a priest and started going down the tubes, I thought, you know, you're showing si symptoms of the disease. I guess you better stop. My mom always said if they'd only admit it, then they can do something about it. And I was beginning to think, well, it looks like you're a pre-alcoholic anyway. If you are, that means you're not going to learn how to drink right. Save yourself some trouble and just stop. I thought, well, I wonder when I'm going to stop. And I kind of messed with that. And not to tell the whole thing, but I, I stopped for six months one time and started again because I figured anybody who could stop for six months had proved he could stop. Yeah. And as long as you know you can stop, you might as well start because... <laughs> If you have any trouble, you just stop again. You know? And um, and I um, and then I got into started getting into trouble and making resolutions and doing my chapter three and four. And um, and the point I want to make about the the first step is that as it sunk into me, yeah, you're really an alcoholic. You just got to stop. I always thought that if I ever if this gets serious. <laughs> I mean, it's hard, and there's obsession and everything. But if it gets, when the chips are down, if it gets serious, I'll stop. Because 
even that powerless, all that's kind of rhetoric for people who don't understand. Because I'm somebody, I, I was willing to say I was alcoholic, you see, understanding that in a very shallow way. Clinging to my identity of being somebody who had a little sense. And that when, it, when push came to shove, when it really got tough, well, I'll come through. I'll come through. I'm the kind of guy who comes through. I have a little sense. I'm not totally nuts. A little crazy, ha, ha, ha. But, I mean, when it gets serious, I'll do it. No. And, um, and when it got serious, I'd quit, all right, and then I'd start. And I got in trouble and was fired. And then I went to a hospital and had aversion treatments. And that, my gosh, they got me. I guess it's only fair and square. I thought I could stop. You know, I didn't, the embarrassment needed this. And went through aversion treatments and got all set and lasted four months and was drinking again. Was in terrible trouble, went back and took the whole aversion treatment thing over again. And then it was, and then something began to, that cold chill inside that something is awfully wrong. You know? Something's out of hand. And I don't know quite what it is or what to do. I was saying my prayers. I was even admitting I was alcoholic and saying my prayers and getting drunk. I didn't think it made any sense to go to AA because if I went there, all they'd do is tell me what I already knew. <laughs> they tell me I'm alcoholic, and I know that. The first one gets you drunk, I can tell them stories about that. I know that. And they'll tell me that I should trust God. And I just as soon not have some ex-Mormon trying to explain that to me. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, do that on my own. And I wouldn't... Um, I clung to my identity. Uh, I think it's... The point here is identity. When we take the first step, our identity is crushed. It's overcome. Nobody can let go of their identity while with your eyes open and being calm. You don't turn in who you are and say, okay, I'll give up trying to maintain this identity. Doesn't seem to be working very well. Um, I'll take a new one. I'd like to reconstruct one and, uh, uh, along more realistic lines and uh, any suggestions. Uh, we don't treat this sensibly. It's a, it's a spiritual thing. Because we don't even, I don't think we know what our identity is until it's crushed. We don't know the sticking point, what we're clinging to hardest. My, my self-understanding is somebody, for me it was someone with a little sense. And when it comes to alcohol, I don't have a little sense. I'm insane. I have a disease where I act insanely in regard to alcohol unless I have massive support of a very special kind that I don't make up. That's a support that comes through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and a help from a power greater than myself to other people and the steps and the fellowship and that supporting me seems to open me up to receive the gifts of sobriety where I can live like a human being while I stay an alcoholic. Uh, but that's not what I understood myself. I, no, no. I just couldn't get that. I, I didn't, it didn't ever occur to me I would ever be that bad off. I thought, yeah, I need God's help, of course. I need God's help, you know, the way you need a little extra push or something. That's not the way we need God's help. We need God's help if someone just to pick the mess off the floor. Up, you know, I need God's help in a big way. I need God's help to give me the wisdom that I just don't have at all. It's not that I need a few more hints. I can't, I need one more piece of the puzzle. I don't need one more piece of the puzzle. I need to drop the whole project and humbly accept the invitation to walk in a radically different way. Accepting myself as a powerless person of alcohol who needs massive support and a fellowship uh, through some simple, all that stuff. I, it's different, you know. Uh, and I can't, Agree to that because I don't even have a place to stand to look at it. You know, I'm uh, there's no place, no perspective, and the only way is is, is a tumbling through, losing your identity. Um, that seems to be the way it works. It's not an intellectual process; it's a spiritual process. The spiritual process of 
um, somehow, and maybe it's the most mysterious thing in the world, you know. Do you know why some people sober up and some people don't? I don't know. We can describe a little bit about what we do, what we don't do. I don't think we understand it. But there's some moment where something inside lets go and I'm willing to be an utter failure at trying to be what I thought I should be. I'm willing to be a, a this is settled. I can't do that. I, I didn't make it. Now, it's pretty fundamental. When I admit failure on the deepest thing I was trying to do, that makes me disappear. That makes me, as my old understanding of myself, collapses. I don't get to say anymore, I'm someone with a little sense. I'm nuts relative to alcohol. Anyway, that it, I experienced that. And I, with, um, uh, there are two, a couple of first step experiences I'd like to share. One was in the host, my sixth detox under lock and key. Uh, and it was in the, while I was there, it occurred to me that I was going to be drunk again pretty soon. It occurred to me, you're the type that gets drunk again, no matter what you do. Doesn't matter what prayer you pray, what counselor you talk to, what resolution you make, what book you read. Doesn't matter. You're flawed. It doesn't, things don't work with you. You just get drunk again because you just lose interest in recovery, a little bored with it, and just have a drink. You're the heartbreaker. You're the one there's nothing to talk about with you. you know? Because we've talked enough. You've got enough motivation to do it. But you don't. That's you. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's a first... I consider that a gift from God and permitting me to experience my powerlessness over alcohol. It didn't feel good at the time. It, uh, but it has a little good feeling to it. The little good feeling was, oh, I don't have to do that. I'm a failure. I'll kind of adjust to that, you know. Um, and then the next, I went back east and I was at a recovery house in New Jersey going to meetings and getting to like it and not knowing why I liked it. I was identifying with people. You know? I, was, I was home. Of course I liked it. Uh, and as I was going along, I remember hearing a guy uh, give a pitch and he says, and the thing about me is I can only stay sober one day at a time. No, I'd been listening to the guy. He already had me, see? I was identifying with him. And when he said one day at a time, I consider that the most empty, meaningless slogan that AA had. The kind of thing you say to brain-damaged people when you can't think of anything else to say. <clears throat> you know, one day at a time, like two days at a time, three days... Didn't mean anything, you know. Kind of an empty slogan to me, you know. Irritating, besides. Um, and when this guy said one day at a time, because I was identifying with him, I believed him. I didn't even know. I just believed him. And the minute I believed him, I, my feeling was, oh, the poor guy. I didn't think he was that bad. He seemed kind of smart. Um, <laughs> well, I guess he was, you know. Show up each morning. I can't remember enough. You know, can't remember what I learned before. Got to start one day all over again today. <laughs> you know? you know? I wanted to get it together, you know. And he's talking about showing up with your empty bowl humbly before God. A little sobriety, please. <laughs> I don't have any. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I thought, and then it's a few beats later I realized it applied to me. And as I realized it applied to me, I felt humiliated. I felt like a five-year-old. Here's little Terry. He's sober all day today. Isn't that wonderful? Very nice. Very good. Now you run along now. We'll call you later. <laughs> and they, in a few beats after that, that humiliation began to change. 
into a very deep relief. No. I was humiliated relative to my old identity, relative to my ego. It didn't match my understanding of my macho, intellectual, I'll take care of it. Uh, I have a little sense. It doesn't. And it's, so it destroyed that, you know. Uh, and, but the, the relief, you know, identifying with somebody, see, hitting bottom to be constructive is just about dying from frustration and identifying with somebody else with the same frustration who's living. So that we can stand identifying with the, the depth of our own powerlessness, but with that identification, there's a spark of hope where we can stand it. You know, where the, the message is, you can be that bad and live. You can be that bad and live very well. Do just fine. So it was, uh, I was uh, like, like walked to a tunnel. And at the other end of the tunnel was this, whew, I could drop this terrible burden. I felt like I was, um, uh, somebody who was carrying around, to be sober on the wagon, to be dry on the wagon is like carrying about seven army blankets. You know, I don't know, I think of army blankets, the hard wool. And if you carry seven of them, you could do it. But if you're carrying them, you know, this is going to get old. <laughs> you know? I can do this, but I have a feeling I'm going to lose interest in this. <laughs> and, uh, that's being dry to me. That's sobriety without the program. And the, it just said to me, a day at a time meant I could drop all the blankets on the floor. I don't, I, I don't have to stay sober for the rest, the rest of my life every minute. You know? I was always staying sober for the rest of my life every minute. Every minute, I had the whole rest of my life in there. <laughs> Being, you know, the fun is over. Uh, too bad I'll never be able to relax again <laughs> for the rest of my natural life. Um, that kind of thing. And the, so that's the relief, um, of just acknowledging that we're alcoholic. It's, but it's, there's a lot in there. It's kind of a simple experience very often when we simply identify and become part of the fellowship and kind of be one with other people and have that attitude. But the, uh, one of the things we do when we, when we agree to be alcoholic is that we agree not to even try to get over it. We agree not to think, we kind of get in on the attitude that, oh, this isn't the thing you feel bad about, okay? This is the thing you just get matter of fact about. We're not working on this anymore. We're not working on getting, improving our alcoholism. Like getting it to be not real bad alcoholism, getting it to be civilized, not so bad alcoholism. We're not working on that. We're, could you have died from drinking? If the answer is yes, that's as bad as, you need, as, bad as anybody can get. And um, so we, we become, the shame just drains away. It drains away. We become more matter of fact, more relaxed. And that <laughs> wonderful spirit of very deep self-acceptance and it spreads. It's not just self-acceptance of our own alcoholism. It's the acceptance of other people's alcoholism um, that's very positive. You notice how there's a, there's a deep wisdom in the fellowship. When somebody comes in and, um, and they're kind of new and they talk about a drunk dream or an obsession to drink or their car almost went into, into the... just went and parked its regular place at the liquor store and they didn't even know how it did it, you know, and they're halfway out of the car... And they say, I'm, I was going into the liquor store the way I usually do. And I realized I was going to get a, get a bottle and I caught myself and I felt confused and kind of ashamed and you know what? How can this happen? And what's the reaction? Your reaction to that? The reaction is, isn't it wonderful you didn't have to have a drink? <laughs> Great. You had an obsession. Yeah, yeah, that's because you're an alcoholic. And there's an affirmation of the person and their disease and a rejoicing. That they didn't have to suffer from actually drinking. Do you ever think of saying, you did what? Um, you did. You, 
you, you've heard all these pitches and you still want to drink? Yeah? You don't have any... I mean, can't you catch on to anything? You know? Uh, you know, there's the deep wisdom. The fact that I just said that shocked you, didn't it? And yet, that talk that we never hear in the program is logical talk if you had, didn't take the first step. If you didn't have the spiritual experience of the first step. It takes a deep wisdom with it that's supportive of other people all the time. And that deep wisdom and that inner peace and that, that foundation of beginning to work a program where we get to know something about having the serenity to accept the things we cannot change and that we shouldn't have to change. Nobody can change. Don't worry about it. It's not like, oh, gee, we can't change it. Uh, no. no. Well, we can't change. We shouldn't change. Shouldn't try to. It's just fine. Um, that is a funny thing about it, is that uh, as we find an equilibrium and a peacefulness and kind of a matter of fact, yeah, the alcoholic, yeah. yeah let me tell you about it. You know? um, there's this wonderful fresh air around it, you know? the relaxation. And when you have it, it seems as if, when that shame drains away from being alcoholic, and it just, like, out from going to meetings and just not having a drink a day at a time, and you, and you do get pretty just relaxed about it, it just seems so natural. Like, why, why was I ever worried about this? Why was this too bad when a person has to be ashamed of their condition? Um, and it just seems to be so true and natural that it's hard to imagine losing it. And we lose it as soon as we stop nourishing it. It's a dynamic thing. We lose it, that we don't lose it all at once, but we, it erodes and shame and confusion return. The minute we block off the normal support and nourishment we need for the first step. The normal support and nourishment we need is constant live identification with other folks in the same situation. And when someone stops going to meetings and stops kind of walking that path, isn't it funny how they just like it not to bring it up? You know? You're an alcoholic? Well, yes. What's it to you? Yeah. It, as soon as there's a little regret, you know, a little regret seeps in, we're on our way back to shame. There's a, uh, I have to say that the commandments of the world are in force at all times. They're in the air, they're in our bones, and it works against the first step. These commandments of the world, I made them up, so don't take them too seriously. But they... <laughs> It occurred to me when someone was complaining one time about the commandments in Scripture that there are commandments that have nothing to do with God or Scripture that are harder on us than any other commandments. And I've, I've internalized these, and I'll just give you the ones I think are in force, and you see if you identify with this. These are the commandments I think that we learn early. We internalize them. We never have to have them repeated again because we, we got them. And we try to obey them automatically at all times. Number one, there's five of them. Number one, thou shalt not have anything wrong with you. <laughs> Number two, if you have something wrong with you, get over it fast. <laughs> Number three, if you can't get over it, at least pretend that you got over it. <laughs> Number four, if you can't even pretend you got over it, we'd like you to stay away from here. <laughs> Number five, if you insist on hanging around her anyway, we'd like you to have the decency of being ashamed of yourself. <laughs> did, you, did you get him inside of you enough? Yeah. That's a living thing. The living force of shame that's in our society, that we've learned. And unless I have direct, contrary, affirmation, the spirit of living, loving, acceptance, and identification, that kind of stuff just eats in there. 
Trump's up says we practice these principles in all our affairs. And one of the principles it talks about is the first step. And that we not just talk about powerlessness over alcohol, but our lives have become unmanageable and apply the first step to all other areas of our life. I'd like to just say a few things, start a little late, um, about the principle uh, powerlessness in the lives of most of us other than alcohol and that it is really the center of uh, those who work the Elanon program, the center of the disease. In other words, what is it in relationships that's equivalent to alcoholism in re- relative to, al- to drinking, you know, uh, to living a life with alcohol? Now, what is it in the Al-Anon program that you accept as what you cannot change about yourself? And what is it that you change. We change our own footwork, our behavior. What is it that we do? Well, we say we don't change them, right? We don't change people, places, and things. We give our own witness, right? What about inside of ourselves? What is it that we don't change there? The way an alcoholic doesn't change the twofold illness of the allergy of the body coupled with an obsession of the mind. Don't mess with that. That's there. What you do is get a program so you get enough help to live with that. And it is something I already mentioned. I, well, there's different ways. My opinion is that a good description of it is belief in control. That there's something down deep that's eradicable that you can't root out. It's not something that you work the program to get rid of. It's something on account of which you work the program. If you're an out on for a while and you notice that you main, that you, you've noticed inside yourself that you have a recurring urge to, to control and that you have recurring fantasies, fantasies of bringing about reform uh, in yourself and others, fantasies that, you know, God, if they'd only listen, if they'd only pick up that pamphlet, if they'd only read page... Such and such. If they'd only hear this tape, you got to listen to this tape. Yeah. Uh, if they'd only, and if you have that, if you're ready to sell this sort of thing, I don't consider that the least bit alarming. You know? I consider that signs that you qualify for the program. And if we take those things as a sign that we haven't worked the program hard enough, we can get into real deep trouble because we'll be fighting ourselves. We'll be trying to get ourselves weller than well. We'll be trying to get our... It's the equivalent of an alcoholic trying to get over alcoholism. To get... It'll be an awkward kind of tape because it'll turn over in a few more minutes. Um, It'll be... Um, so the equivalent of an alcoholic accepting the feeling of an obsession you have uh, you catch yourself in the middle of let's say just a sort of a depression in the day you're just having a lousy day you feel lousy and uh, and nothing hurts really you're just and you, you kind of well what's going on you know you start to talk to somebody and you realize that the reason you're you're just sad and angry and hurting that someone you love isn't doing it right. You just damn. You just it, for their own good. They know better now. They you know. They know. They've been to meeting. <laughs> Their sponsor talked to them. And we'll find ourselves just being sad that they're not doing better. Now, the root of it is the belief that if they would change, if I had control over them to change just a little bit, to fine-tune them, then we could be happy and it'd be all right. But I don't, and I believe the control would be good and I don't have it, and that is very sad. 
Um, <laughs> no. When a person, so what's, I think if a person caught himself there, herself, at that point of awareness, and if we didn't work the first step, we had turned on ourselves and beat ourselves up. You stupid. You know, did, did, can you listen? Did, you, you should have learned that in the first few weeks of Al Anon. You know, you know, ball yourself out. And, and besides being depressed, be angry and self contemptuous. Um, uh, you know, really feel worse uh, as a way of purging or something. And, um, uh, and if we work the first step, if we catch ourselves at that point, we could say, ah, okay, it figures that I'd be depressed about that because I have a belief, because I'm the type that is, is convinced that it'd be better for them to behave the way I think they should. And, um, and what I need is not to turn myself inside out. And what I need to do is some pretty basic workouts in the program. A little basic workout of uh, talking to a sponsor and asking God to give me help to release with love and to accept myself as somebody who has a belief in control, but with the help of the program, is going to act more sanely right now so I can you know, live my life and live my life and accept God's gift of this life and, and do some stuff and work with others where I'll get a little more perspective on this so that as I go along with my belief in control, it will control my life and behavior less. And I can have a life. And uh, the alcoholic remains alcoholic, and the al remains somebody who has a belief in control, who with the help of the program can live a life sanely, you know, uh, and can be kind and tolerant of the disturbing feelings that come up when we get recurring attacks of fantasy and and, or discover depression in the middle of that. Um, but put the put it into action. But to catch ourselves, so any alcoholic who catches himself in an obsession, the minute we as we experience the obsession, as we experience the thing coming on, and don't associate it with obsession yet, just just feel the raw. I want to think. I'm going to have a drink. A drink would help a lot, you know. Just we get into the thing. And the first way we experience it always is of shame. You know? We feel disturbed, we feel yearning, and we feel mixed up, and we feel kind of ashamed that we do, and it's confusing. It's always, any obsession is confusing. And that we need the whole program to enter in kindly, you know? Enter in without violence. And, and with respect for ourselves. Say, so don't jump all over yourself. Like, what are you doing? Want to drink? Just, no, that's why you need the program. You qualify for the program. You deserve a hug at the next meeting. <coughs> Feeling like that. Yeah. And on and on. We apply this in all our affairs and all of our. Uh, you know, is anybody in here a liar? <laughs> uh, it's about telling the truth. Now. You know, there's two approaches to growing in the truth. One approach is to get over being a liar. That's the non-program way. Get over it. Do you have the same feeling I have when someone says, one thing about me is I call him as I see him. I tell the truth. No more lying for me. You get the truth out of me. I want to I get out of range, you know. Uh, Because if they, if they think they're telling the truth all the time, I, it's dangerous. You know? uh, I was so taken with somebody who started a pitch, and he said, I'm going to try to tell the truth, but I'm a professional con man, and I'm so good at lying, I don't know half the time when I'm doing it myself. So, so be careful. I, I listened to everything he said. This is fascinating. You know? I want to hear somebody who is able to acknowledge they're a liar, and they need God's help to tell the truth one day at a time. And they've got all the inclinations and the 
and the false and the whatever to tell a lie. But with God's help, we're going to tell the truth enough to live. And you know. Does anyone have any trouble with their sex life? <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, you know, the non program way of handling sex problems is to get over them all. Get over it, you know? And it, depend, <laughs> depending on what it is, you know, if, um, Let's, let, let's pick something biblical. Uh, <laughs> let's pick uh, something, you know, it's a classic, adultery. Uh, okay. If, if, it, if, it's, if adultery has been in your life and you didn't feel terrific about it, uh, you might say, well, I want to get over that. Nope. <laughs> over. No more of that. So finish. You know, that's the non-program way. Program way is to say, I'm an adulterer forever who doesn't commit adultery today and uh, with any kind of luck won't find it necessary to go through the the double speak and the confusion and the uh, all that stuff, all that emotional draining and lots of hard work and uh, that's required, <laughs> um, and uh, and that I'll maintain the status, however, of being an adulterer, because I don't want to let my own fear and ego uh, be pandered to to try to get me ooh, away from that. You know, I get away from things. You want to get away from? And the first step says we're not above anything. We don't get away. From anything. We don't get over anything. We are invited by a higher power to accept everything, accept ourselves as powerless over alcohol, powerless over relationships, and that one day at a time, with God's help in the program, we can act more sanely and have a life. And the more we identify with one another, the more deeply peaceful we become with who we are. And we got to figure that part of our problem is when we're hurting and, and when the ego is out there, that we'll always have an urge to do some real dumb thing to make ourselves feel better. <laughs> we'll have an urge to abolish, you know, get over something completely, instead of simply humbly doing our footwork. And when we humbly do footwork and stay in the fellowship, we do very well, you know. And we, uh, and it's the first, the first step call. Well, with that, I started late, but it's almost a whole hour. So let's, uh, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. And I'll, um, I guess I should say, I'll get a little, uh, paper in the morning. I'll have a paper to sign for, um, little, right before the first talk. If you want to talk one on one and I'll have the time to talk to a few people, just be up here and sign the paper. Uh, but now let's, we we'll pray the Lord's Prayer, then have a break of about ten minutes or so and have a little sharing meeting for an hour. Stand. This is the end of session one, the start of session two. Good morning, everybody. Let's pray the Serenity Prayer. God, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah. Okay, I mentioned, uh, don't put the tape yet, okay? <laughs> okay. I'd like to share a bit this uh, with you this morning on the issue of faith in a higher power, the second step. I came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Um, and there's a, I think we're all in the same starting line with this. You know, the priests and the atheists have the same challenge and the same discovery, the same gift from God and being given 
a faith that works. In the fourth chapter, the big book, to the agnostic, it says the whole purpose of this book is to enable you to find a higher power that will solve your problem. It's a, it's a very practical approach. This is real American, real pragmatic. Uh, it isn't too theoretical. It's like, let's, let's find something that works in this area of faith. Uh, and of course, what, what works is usually something very different than what we have been doing before. Uh, someone said the only person sicker than a, than someone at their first AA meeting or first Al Anon meeting is that person's higher power. Uh, because our, under, our understanding of God, our understanding of a higher power usually gets sick along with us. This isn't that God gets sick along with us. Our understanding gets perverted along with our disintegration in other departments so that we come... And yet, even acknowledging that, that there's a... Um, uh, you know, we come with, with this, our fears have a lot to do, and our frustrations have a lot to do with the negative notion of a higher power very often. In spite of that, we start with what we got. You know, you can't just make up one from scratch. You kind of link together. We, we, as we start to recover, our notion of a higher power recovers along with us. That's part of the thing. There's a, so if you're, you know, if you've had a uh, religious background where you're very much associated with the church, um, or your own prayer meditation thing is kind of strong, uh, or whether um, it's been disillusionment or and that you've rejected all that or or you never heard of it to begin with, um, we need almost certainly as we begin our recovery, we need a fresh understanding and approach to faith. Because my understanding of our disease, the family disease, Alcoholism or reacting to alcoholism. Either either way, when we're in that disease, we are trapped in self-will. We we just can't help it. I mean, it isn't that we're we're just mean-spirited and selfish. It's that we're trying to survive. We're trying to get through the day. And if you're trying to get through the day as an alcoholic. You just got to get some things done. I mean, you don't come up in your driveway just coming from the liquor store with a bottle in your in a paper sack, and you're trying to get this in the house. And you don't come up in the driveway and say, "Well, higher power, <laughs> if it be your will that I get this safely in the house and get to drink it, fine." Someone catches me and gets mad and empties it down the sink, well, I will be done. Um, uh, uh, you know? We don't have people reacting to other people's alcoholism without the program, say before program, saying, well, you know, if they keep drinking and have to suffer a little more and, well, if, that, if, the, if in the mystery of the way you made human nature and this person, that's the way it's going to be, God bless them, thy will be done. Uh, if, uh, you know, we, we're not in a position to have sane attitudes when we're in an insane way of life. So we, we're playing catch-up ball and we're playing emergency. It's emergency all the time. Uh, I gotta have this. I gotta have this. Gotta get the money. I I gotta keep them from finding out. They can't find out. I gotta get it. I gotta. There's always this gotta gotta. And if we're in a gotta gotta way of life, then our understanding of a higher power usually deteriorates. Usually, we think of uh, our image of a god if we're even bothering to think is kind of a. 
an impersonal, sometimes he helps you out, and sometimes he doesn't. Never can tell. Uh, <laughs> batting about, you know, about one out of four times. Uh, God comes through. And, uh, uh, and it just seems like, well, why bother? It, whether you pray or not, you get about the same percentage. Um, <laughs> when the prayer is, I gotta have this, I gotta, have it. uh, that attitude, you know. Uh, when we're treating God, uh, really the, when we're in our disease, or when we're in recovery and, and get old ideas, our notion of a higher power is that of the adversary. We have an adversarial relationship with God, and as we begin to recover, we are given an experience of God as ally. We start to experience our higher power as truly ally who's ahead of us. Um, part of the image of a higher power as adversary, it's uh, God, when we're not into it in the spirit of this program, a higher power is, is usually somebody that you're trying to you have to keep up with you. God is kind of a big, dumb God. <laughs> You've got to keep explaining things to him. Yeah. <laughs> explaining a lot and cajoling and saying, come on, come on. It's sort of the big fella in the sky you're pulling along <laughs> to help you out with special jobs, you know. And, um, that's you know the adversary. He's always slow on the pickup. Oh, oh, is that what you wanted? I don't know. Um, and the kind of faith that we begin to find here is just the opposite. It's the it's where our higher power is ahead of us, uh, always giving us things that are so ahead of our understanding of what we need that we're receiving what we need for weeks and months before we figure out this is what I needed. Um, and there's, and it's always our higher power smarter than us instead of dumber and pulling along. It's kind of in the future and, and pulling us forward. Uh, and it's never answering our prayers the way we pray them because we pray our prayers with our old fearful mind. And our higher power is more merciful than to let us give instructions on exactly what the world needs in ourselves. If we had all of our prayers answered just the way we pray them, uh, we would be a true menace to the neighborhood. Uh, uh, we'd be, there wouldn't be a newcomer on the face of the earth that could talk to you. Uh, you'd be so good and perfect and poised and together, you'd scare away anyone who is still having any problems, um, they just take one look at you and resent you um, uh, for being so together. Um, there's a an incident that uh, kind of a dis an awakening experience that's not mine, that I, I share a lot in retreats and places I haven't been here for a while, I certainly will share it. Uh, it came from a woman who has since died sober in the program. Her name was Gail, and a uh, very sharp lady. And she's, um, I heard this, she had this in a regular AA pitch. Uh, when I was, uh, I was quite new going to meetings myself. And she was telling her story, and kind of early in it, she just said that she, she was from the Midwest, and she was in the largest um, subgroup in Alcoholics Anonymous. Ex-Catholic. Um, uh, she had moved out from this dull town in Kansas to um, California, and uh, she was on her own and got uh, a place to stay, a little apartment. And she said she got there, uh, finally Liberty, you know, the big city away from these oppressive small-town people. Um, and she said she was only sure of two things when she got to Los Angeles. One was that there was no God. And she forgets what the other thing was. She was sure. Um, and uh, and as she as she started out, I think she had this little apartment with uh, the four areas an apartment has. You know, this four area. Even if it's all kind of one room, it's at least areas of the room. But they usually have a bathroom, 
in a little kitchen area, and then a bedroom, bed, oh, and then kind of a little living little living room thing. Well, she had her four areas, and in her living room she had a green couch. Well, when she was first there, she said she did things pretty much in the four areas. Food in the kitchen, the bathroom has its role. You sleep in the bedroom and do some stuff in the living room. But as time went on, she spent more and more time on this green couch drinking vodka. And she, and as time went on more, she began to spend just about all of her time on the green couch. And she gradually began to do on the green couch everything you do in the other rooms. Uh, uh, sleeping, stuff you do in the bathroom, any eating you do, eat the green couch. The green couch became a very unhealthy environment um, after a time. And the only time she'd leave the green couch was to make the run uh, and get back there with some vodka and her cigarette burned moo moo um, and hang out on the green couch. And she was dying on the green couch and uh, alone and couldn't get off and was in despair. And I forget the details of the 12-step call, but somehow she made a call to somebody who called somebody who came over, and she got to a meeting, kind of took her to a meeting. And, well, she, the, the big deal was that she just didn't have a drink after her first meeting. She was uh, goofy, and she didn't know which end was up, and but she managed to get back there and just not have a drink, and uh, back and forth from meetings to this little place. And as time went on, she began to hear about higher power, faith, God, prayer, trust God, and she said, oh no, because she had this thing she was sure of, that there was no God, and so she just put it on hold and off to the side, she liked the other part because she was starting to come alive a little bit, and so she kind of just kept this faith business to the side, and uh, and the weeks went by and the months went by, and she got more and more uncomfortable and felt the pressure of the whole issue, uh, but didn't know what to do with it. Um, and it was so obvious to her there was no God. And uh, I think, I don't know how many, several months into recovery, when she was starting to work again and got the place cleaned up and the green couch cleaned up and uh, uh, kind of rolling along, she said she, she came in to her apartment and opened the door and took a few steps in and stopped. And it dawned on her who her higher power was. Her higher power was the one who keeps her off the green couch. She had an experience. She couldn't get off the green couch, but she was off. And standing up and sober and kind of bright. And she, there was no accounting for how she got from there to here. And whatever the mystery was, it was some power greater than herself because it didn't even tire her out to make the trip. One of the ways you can tell when God's helping you is when you don't get tired from doing it. Like you accomplish more and do less, or something like that. Um, there's a... Everybody here has a green couch story. Everybody here has experienced something like that. And there are some elements I told her right after the beating. Grabbed her, I was very moved with that thing. And, and I said, you know, you're very Jewish. She looked at me. Didn't look offended, but she looked puzzled. Um, I said, uh, "I said that's your story about the green couch is, is an exact parallel of the Exodus story. Uh, it's being in slavery in Egypt and crying out, and then getting help that you didn't want. Uh, 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 it's." In Egypt, what they wanted was straw for the bricks and better food. Instead, they got someone who came along and said, I'd like you to leave the country uh, and to go to a promised land and start something completely new and different and fresh and a new relationship. Well, all, uh, wait a minute. We weren't... Well, it's this or nothing. Uh, and then off you go. And in the middle of getting helped by this higher power, you're in the middle of the desert. You're sitting in a Al-Anon meeting with someone going on and on, and you're wondering, is this rescue? Uh, uh, you know, you're not so sure that this is even what you... It's not what you asked for. 
You're not quite so sure it's what you wanted. But it's definitely a lot better than it was before. Uh, that's a characteristic. See, any contact with a higher power that's in the tradition of the faith that's mentioned in the 12 steps, in the tradition of the Judeo-Christian faith experience, that's in the tradition of the faith of Islam, uh, the faith of, uh, and, the, and Buddhism has this in common. The, the great spiritual tradition, uh, everybody's spiritual awakening and the trip always involves transformation, transformation. It's never a matter of, of having a big dumb God that you've got to explain a lot of things to and cajole into doing what you want. Uh, it's always a higher power who transforms our minds, transforms our hearts so that we're taught to want what we truly need and we were too sick and hurting to know what to want. Uh, and it was always something, you know, short term and anything to stop the pain, stops the flow of blood. Um, and But we're, no, no, no. Our higher power, the creator, the one, the, the source of love and wisdom, you know, wants the best for us. And instead of letting us set the term, uh, instead of letting the sick one explain to the well one how to take care of them, this, we alcoholics are notorious, and al the same. We're notorious for explaining to people ready to help us what they should do to help us. The, uh, you know, I get a chance as a, as a clergyman in the, having people come to talk to me in a parish setting over the years, I've had a lot more people who need Al-Anon come to talk to me than who need, because the alcoholics don't come to the rectory. You know. they don't, uh, sometimes, but mostly it's somebody, a relative comes to enlist me into the plot uh, of how to cure this other person. And, um, and so what I have is someone coming to give me instructions on how to help them from a diseased mind. And, uh, and the best help I can give, of course, is to refuse to let that person set the agenda. And people get very upset when you will not go along with their agenda. Uh, and this is, this is why the second step is after the first step. <laughs> this is why we don't start out with faith. Because we can't get into a fresh faith unless we hit bottom. Unless we get so shaken. Unless the rope is, is yanked out of our hands with our fingernails still in it. And somehow our own agenda has to be destroyed. Our own nitpicky, self-centered, pathetically narrow way of getting it together. Uh, we have to be so discouraged from having that work that we actually lose interest in it or or just kind of know it won't work to create a little opening, a little opening for a really fresh beginning. And that happened to Gail. Okay? She was so out of it that she, her agenda was to get some, figure out how to drink and not get into trouble. And well, she was beyond that, you know. And so she was given another uh, help, a character, some characteristics of, if you want to know if you're being helped by a higher power, one is that our higher power seems to be very little interested in pandering to our ego needs. <laughs> Uh, usually when you get help by God it, you don't look particularly better after the help um, uh, you <laughs> you know you probably cry more after the help and uh, and your um, and the view from within is, is interesting uh that when we're being helped by God, usually, instead of getting rid of the of the limitations, the pain, the character defects, the the frustrations that are within us, what we want is please get rid of that stuff. Help me out of this. Get over it. 
um, and instead of getting rid of it, we we get help. Where we're drawn into life so that we can we don't suffer the same frustration the same way. But instead of kind of turning out nice, <laughs> we notice our character defects a lot more clearly than ever before. Alcoholics are barely alcoholic when they get to AA. <laughs> barely. <laughs> you know? With God's help, you become really alcoholic. You know? uh, and al and we might be a little bit self-centered when we get here. I admit, I haven't been the most generous person in the world. But with God's help, we realize we are pathetically self-centered. Where we're, it's comical, uh, the way I refer all things to myself. You know, in the middle of the most generous helping of others, I stop to pose for pictures. Um, uh, yeah, wondering how I go. Um, I mean, it's, and if and when you go come to a, Al-Anon, you know, you just yeah, you're a little maybe there's a little bit of manipulation in your life. You admit that, and then with God's help. You find out that you've been scheming manipulation most of your waking hours, you know, for uh, for years. It's been just a, a preoccupying, all day long, churning plot of uh, how to control your environment, um, the people in it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.